it's important to develop a hobby because you're not just defined by your job. You may be spending 90% of your time at work, but that's just one part of you. You can't just work all the time. I just wanted to do something different. Welcome to the Career Relaunch Podcast, where we discuss how to reinvent your career. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more meaningful work and enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have stepped off the beaten path to reinvent their careers. We talk through their unique personal journeys, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you understand what it takes to relaunch your own career. Today, my guest is going to share her story of going from a conference event planner to an IT firm manager. We'll discuss the unique role transitional jobs play in your career and how side activities outside of work can be so therapeutic. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'll discuss how personal hobbies can help you in your professional life. Happy New Year. I hope 2023 is off to a good start for you. Pursuing hobbies and interests outside of your day job is something we probably all wish we could do more of. Hobbies can help you relax and reduce stress, unlock your creativity, increase your productivity when you return to work, and even uncover new opportunities and relationships. But if you're like me, you might find it difficult to make time for your hobbies when you're so busy with work, family, and other life commitments. In this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about how your hobbies outside of work can have a positive impact not only on your life, but also on your career. To kick off season seven of the Career Relaunch podcast, I'm speaking today with Jenny Go, who initially thought she would become a scientist. So she spent her university days studying biology and heading down the research path. But when she was working toward her graduate degree, she realized that a career in research wasn't what she really wanted and maybe wasn't exactly her natural forte. So she started soul searching and exploring things like event planning and eventually landed roles working in IT for companies like IBM. Now as a project manager and scrum master at Accenture, She's hoping to use the skills and knowledge she's gathered over the years to hopefully help and inspire others in their careers. Now, I first crossed paths with Jenny on Medium, where we exchanged a couple of messages about each of our respective career changes. And after we exchanged a few more emails after that, I discovered that her hobby of learning ballet on the side has had a direct impact on her perspectives while she's at work. So I wanted to get Jenny onto the show to not only explain her career transition, but also to share her thoughts on the importance of feeding your interests outside of work. You can get all the show notes from today's conversation at careerrelaunch.net slash 92. Jenny spoke with me from Singapore. Okay. Hello, Jenny. Welcome to the Career Relaunch podcast. It is great to have you on the show. Hi, Joseph. Thank you for having me here. All right. I am really happy that we are finally able to do this. You and I first crossed paths on Medium, actually, and I know we've been trying to record this for quite some time. What are you up to right now in your career, in your life? What's been keeping you busy? I'm actually currently working on a government project here as a scrum master. So I'm kind of like a deputy project manager helping to manage the day-to-day progress of the project, basically running the project for the client, making sure it meets their timeline and expectations. So I'm actually really busy with work and I'm also busy with moving to a new place. So these two activities have taken up the main bulk of my time. Now you're based in Singapore. Can you tell me a little bit about where you live there and what your neighborhood's like, just so we get a sense of where you are there in Singapore? I think uh, most of our listeners probably know that Singapore is like really small. I live in this township, we call it township, that's called Serangoon. It's actually a rather matured and old estate, but very developed. So you can just stay here. You don't need to go out of this little township and you can get everything here. If you've been to Singapore, it's not like Orchard or any downtown places, but it's kind of like just a very neighborhood place that has everything. I kind of like it here. It's very crowded, but I like it because it's very convenient. So I live just five minutes away from the train station. So I've been staying here for three years now, and I'm going to move next month. (laughs) Where are you originally from, Jenny? Because I know you haven't always lived in Singapore. I was born in Malaysia. I was raised 
there. And then I actually moved to Singapore when I was 19. And I have since then spent like 20 years here. Final thing before we go back in time and talk about your first role as a computer engineer. I know one of the reasons why we haven't been able to record this for some time is because you've been struggling a little bit with COVID. And I was wondering if you could just tell me about what impact COVID has had on your life, both health-wise and also just personally. I just caught COVID about a month ago, actually around five weeks. And I was one of those people who had like really serious symptoms, right? Not just like asymptomatic. You can just like chill out at home, right? I had high fever for three days. I'm nursing a persistent cough. It's been five weeks. I think people would say that's almost like a long COVID. I think that has a significant impact in my life because I've been starting to think like, should I maybe consider seriously this work-life balance thing? Not that I've never think about it before, but I think that it makes me even more conscious about my life because I'm struggling to get back to my physical activities because I'm actually quite active but I have to cut my exercises by half. Thank you so much for doing this. I know you're not fully recovered and I appreciate you squeezing this in as you're trying to recover. And I just hope you end up getting better soon. And we're gonna come back to some of the importance of physical activity to you in your life toward the end when we talk about ballet. I was wondering if we could, first of all, just go back in time, because I know you haven't always been in your current project manager role. Could you take me back all the way back in time and tell me about what you think you wanted to become when you grew up and what you ended up doing as your first role when you finished up in university. When I was young, you know, I went to maybe grade seven or eight. And at the time, you know, when we started having internet, right, I thought it was cool. And I thought I wanted to be like a software engineer or computer engineer, right? But you know, my last year in high school, I discovered genetics and I thought, hey, that's actually way more interesting. (laughs) At that time, there was a boom in the biomedical industry and I was getting a lot of influence when, you know, when I was choosing what to do in university, right? I actually received two offers. One is engineering, the other one is life sciences. And after a whole round of struggle, I decided to choose life sciences and I devoted the first about eight years of my life to it. Although I'm doing something vastly different now, I would say that, you know, genetics to a larger extent, biology is still my favorite. And how did you know whether you wanted to stick with biology versus going and trying something different? My career is slightly different. I mean, even if you study biology, you could pursue many career paths, right? You could be a high school teacher. You could be a lecturer in the college. You could also be a researcher. You could be a salesperson, what have you, right? And I originally chosen the academic path. I thought I would become a researcher and maybe someday teach in a university. But the path as a researcher is not for the faint-hearted. And, you know, after some years down the road, I realized that I am not super good at it. Like, I love it, but I'm not going to excel in it. It was actually when I was halfway pursuing my doctorate and I was having this self-reflection. Should I continue or not? How did you know that you weren't good at it, just out of curiosity? Because it takes a lot to admit that we're not actually good at something that we've already invested a lot of time into. As a student, as a researcher, right, you do need to submit some papers, right? You need to publish your own paper, right? In comparison to my peers, I think I was struggling with it. I couldn't meet my own expectations or like, you know, the benchmark that I have, right? Like this is where my peers are at. I think I'm supposed to be here around the same time, right? But I know that I can't. At that point, I knew that I wasn't going to do very well in it. And I spent a lot of time in the lab. And a lot of it is animal studies, right? And you're exploring a project by yourself. And by nature, I'm a sociable person. After some time, I feel like 
maybe I actually prefer a job that has more interactions with people. And you're right; it takes a lot to admit that you're not good in something. But I think once you are able to do that, you open up more opportunities for yourself, right? I can't remember if I told you this, Jenny, but I was also one of those students in university who studied the pre-medical sciences, actually. And one of the courses I had to take was biology, a full-year biology course, and ended up doing a fellowship at a medical school focused on pharmacology research. And so I was spending all my days and nights sometimes in the lab, literally like pipetting (laughs) different substances and materials. And I spent most of my time counting cells versus actually interacting with people. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I like you, I just felt like, this is just not me. And I remember not being very good at it. Like I remember when we had to present our results to the faculty, I was the only person whose results didn't turn out the way that I had hoped they would turn out. So how did you then go from working in that field into what you ended up doing next, which I understand was actually event planning as a bit of a transition into your next chapter in your career? I mustered up all the courage and I told my supervisor, like, look, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to graduate with master's degree. And then, you know, I was thinking then now what? I have a lot of options, but I may not have the necessary qualifications to do those jobs, right? To pursue those opportunities. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do, what I, where are my interests, right? And I thought that technology is the second thing that I like. But you know, at that time, IT was taking off and I didn't have the necessary qualifications. I don't know how to get in there. And then I thought maybe then I should just continue looking for jobs in life sciences. But it was tough. Either you graduated with like just a bachelor's and you take up some jobs or you have to have a doctorate degree and then you can go to work for pharmaceutical companies and then you have a decent job and good opportunities. But just having a master's degree is like hanging there. I struggled looking for jobs. And that time, this event company They were looking for someone with life sciences background to plan the program and events for life sciences. They offered me the job and I took it up because I was looking for jobs for a few months already. Did you feel like this is where you wanted to end up in event planning or did you kind of feel like this was a transitional role? I'm just curious because sometimes what comes up with people who are trying to make a career change is they wait for the perfect role or I guess in your case, maybe you wait for the right pharmaceutical job to come up or the right IT job to come up. How did you come to the decision to take this event planning job, which sounds very different from what you had originally thought to do? It really was a transition, you know, because I live here by myself. And ever since I graduated from university, I stopped asking for help from my parents, right? And, you know, I really struggled a few months and I couldn't get a job. I had some friends who helped me and I have plenty of friends willing to refer me to jobs, but it would be working in the laboratory again. I already knew I don't want to go down that path. And I'm not a super ambitious person, but I do wish to achieve something in my life. And I know that continue to work as a research assistant or associate in a lab is not what I want. So I turned down the offers. You know, there were people who helped me. Those are not jobs that I want. And as I was struggling, well, you need to pay the bills, right? So I got this job and I thought, why not I just take the job and I slowly figure out where to go from here. How was that being in that event planning job for you, knowing that it wasn't maybe ultimately what you wanted to do the rest of your life, but that it was giving you a steady paycheck and something to keep yourself busy as you tried to figure out what to do next? That is a very different industry, I must admit. Like when I first started, I got a culture shock. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were a few people who had the same background as I do. Like they were life sciences graduates, right? 
but everybody else did not have a life science graduate. And that was my first job outside of the academic world. So it was a big culture shock, you know. I have not really been selling things before, but as an event planner, you kind of have to sell your event. And I didn't know how that worked. And then the people there, they come from very diverse background. I actually felt that I was quite lucky because I met some really good colleagues there. And we still remain as friends today. This was about around 10 years ago. Everything felt like, oh my God, this is how things work, you know? (laughs) And it was a small company, very intimate. And I had two events planning job, right? And then the second one was also like a medium-sized company. I learned a lot about the events planning industry, right? And that made me realize that, yes, it truly is just a transition job because it really is not what I want to do. And what steps then did you take to figure out what it was that you did want to do while you had this holdover events planning job? I did continue to apply for pharmacology jobs, right? Although I know that the chances may be slim. A lot of job openings that was put up, you know, it's either like a clinical trials kind of associate coordinator or it's like a lab assistant, or you need to have a PhD. And I wasn't really interested in those. But I also thought that, okay, I can't just get stuck. And I thought that I need to look for an opening to technology companies. So I started looking through jobs, trying to see where I can go, right? How do I get an opening and join? And after some searching, I found a job. So my ex-boss offered me a position at IBM. So that's how I ended up there. And just to switch gears here, now you have entered into the IT sector or the tech sector. And this is now, I'm assuming, very different from what you were doing before, working in a lab, using your biology knowledge, eventually moving into the event space, but still it being related to your background in the sciences. It sounds like this was a complete departure from what you were doing before. How was that transition for you moving into IBM? That was my first MNC job. And I was also culture shock and blown away by many things, you know, because I never worked in a huge company like that. And you're right. A technology as big as that, they tend to move really fast. And I don't know anything at all beyond what I read from the newspaper, right? But I really wanted to start something. And I must admit that, well, I mean, other than feeling scared, I also felt insecure. I wasn't sure if I can keep my job. And there was also the constant fear that I wasn't good enough, you know, I wasn't learning fast enough. And then given that I got a job in an IT company now, but how do I move from here? And I have already changed my job once, like from life sciences to events planning. And from events planning now to IT, I was determined to make it work. Can you describe what it was like on a day-to-day basis for you to be in this tech job versus what you were doing before in biology? And I'm most interested in just hearing about how you knew that this was not just a repeat situation of being in a lab where you were completely misplaced, but that this was just challenging and that it was something that you're going to work on and continue to progress in. In biology, and you definitely understand it because we came from similar background, right? A lot of things are evidence-based, but outside of science, you don't need to be evidence-based. You know, if you end up in a sales job, you can say anything you want. I admit that it was tough for me because I have the tendency to ask, why are people doing this? To me, the world was either black or white, right? Because science is either you can back it by facts or if the fact says it's wrong, it's wrong. And I struggle a lot with that, right? The difference is that in science, it was difficult. You were always searching for answer, but you have to use some kind of evidence to prove it. 
you have failures every day because your results just don't turn out the way you want, right? And then you just keep repeating that. But on the other hand, this job that I first started, right, I was hired as a proposal writer in IBM. And most people are bad at writing. And they wanted someone who could understand what the solution is and put it in a very layman manner, come up with certain creative materials to present to the clients to help them understand better. So I was doing a lot more creative thinking work versus the science work where you need to be very factual. And the other question I have for you about your time at IBM before we move into your most recent transition into Accenture is just what life was like for you in the tech industry as a whole, working in a very fast moving industry, work-life balance, the intensity of the job. Can you give a glimpse into what that was like for you? Joining IBM provided me with very good starting ground because the job there, it's busy, right? But it's not as hectic as my current job. It provided me with a good starting point, you know, slowly learning the ropes. And I was lucky. I do have to say I was always very lucky to have very great and supportive colleagues and mentors. That played an important part in my growth, right? After that, I transitioned into different roles in IBM, right? And it just got more and more hectic from there. And about a year ago, I joined Accenture. And this is by far my most hectic job. And we're talking about hectic as in you go down, you start working and you have time for lunch, but you don't really have time to browse Facebook, <laughs> Google for Black Friday sale. You know, you, you don't <laughs> You're have, working. You don't have time <laughs> yeah. for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're focused. You are 100% on and you do that five days a week, sometimes more. And How have you coped with that pace of life at work, the intensity, the nonstop nature of it? I joined at a time when most of us still have to work from home. And it was hectic right from the get-go. Like the first day I joined, I haven't gone to my orientation and there were people already asking me to join project meetings. And I was like, what? It's just my first day. I don't even know what's happening. I don't even know anyone. (laughs) But because I was working from home, I was still able to like steal some time away to do exercise because I'm physically active, right? So I think that helped a lot with the balance. And because when we work from home, we don't need to take any public transport that cut down on the transit time. So I managed to sleep a little bit more. I think that kind of helped in transition to my current project because now I need to travel to customer's office every single day. I didn't ask you this before, Jenny, but how did you go from IBM to Accenture? Is that a move that you had thought to make from tech into consulting or how did that come about for you? I was already, I think, my sixth year at IBM. Well, my last job there, right, I had an incredible career. I really, really liked it. IBM at that time, they made a huge move. They acquired another company and then their whole strategy changed a little bit. And to be honest, I don't see where I fit in, in that change. I felt like I needed more aggressive growth because I felt like I kind of stagnant a little bit. I was actually being promoted about half a year before I joined Accenture, right? And I was very grateful to my ex-boss, right? He trusted me and that was very important to me. But I envisioned that I could stay in this role for a few years and the growth may not be what I really want. Because I started in IT a lot later than my peers, right? A lot of my peers, they are already directors, you know, they're doing so much better. Well, of course, there's the saying that You don't compare yourself with others, you compare with yourself, but I still want to do well. I want to do something for myself. So I didn't want to stay in a job where I felt that I may not have the kind of growth that I wanted. I started looking out and I actually had a few offers and decided to choose Accenture because I believe that it's the next best place for me to grow. I do want to talk with you about 
this work-life balance topic and some of the activities that you've engaged with outside of work. But before we go to that, I did have one more question about this transition from IBM to Accenture. You mentioned that you, I guess, had a few different job offers on the table. And one of the topics that's been coming up recently in the context of whatever you want to call it, quiet quitting or cushioning, is to, while you're working full time, to go ahead and proactively look for roles or network with recruiters. What was your philosophy on that? If you really, really you felt like you were not being treated correctly and if going through HR is not the route that you want to take, then I would suggest that you do need to take that either quiet quitting part or for some people, they just quit. They don't even quiet quit. They will quit without a job. But suppose if it's just a very hectic job or maybe you're just currently stuck in a project that you don't like, things like that, right? Or maybe just, you know, right now you don't like some of the people that you're working with, but there are the other half of the people that you like, then don't make the decision of quitting so easily. I was very fortunate because I had at one point wanted to quit what I was doing, but I had a very, very good mentor. And he gave me this very good advice that I gave to others right now too. If you felt that you have learned everything you need from your current role or current company, then it's time to go. But if you felt like you still have so much more to learn, it's okay. Just bite the bullet. As long as it's not like people are abusive to you, you know, just bite the bullet, even if it's difficult, because you're not going to regret it. One other thing I wanted to chat with you about, which I know you mentioned to me the first time we connected, was some of the activities outside of work that have helped play a role in your career change journey. Can we talk about ballet for a second here and just explain how that has come up in your life and what role it's played for you, not only in your current job, but also as you think about career transitions in general? It was actually my close friend who introduced ballet to me. So I went for a trial class. I thought that was good. And then after that, I continued. And I have since learned ballet for some three years. Sometimes you're so busy that I felt like I cannot breathe. And it was at ballet that I felt like time just stopped. I could really totally focus on myself. But more importantly, also... My classmates, they come from different backgrounds, you know, women and men of all shapes and sizes. But everybody was just there to pursue one thing that they love. And there was no judgment. Like, even if you can't make a good pirouette, a good turn, no one's going to laugh at you. Everyone is very encouraging. I think that having that safe space knowing that I could make mistakes and still feel happy about it. It's really encouraging and it has helped me cope with the stress at work a lot. I think when we spoke before also, Jenny, you told me about a moment when something happened at work that I think it came from somebody ridiculing something that you had done and that really actually hit you pretty hard. How did ballet then help you deal with that or, or did it was ballet the kind of that sanctuary for you i was actually ridiculed pretty badly at work one day and i felt like oh my i probably should quit this job i can't work with people who are so abusive in the languages that he used right and it was a friday i remember and i always have classes after friday after work so i went to my class you know i must be honest that I was actually at the brink of crying, you know, I thought like that was really terrible. I actually felt humiliated. But when I went dancing, you know, I was just letting it all go, right? I was very focused on my dancing, you know, and I was being reassured by my teacher that it's okay to make mistakes. And I felt like that kind of assurance plus seeing how people put in so much effort and even if they can't do it, it never discouraged that. And of course, you know, dancing to the classical music, 
I think it lifted my spirit a lot. And, you know, subsequently when I returned home, I felt that my heart was a lot lighter. The last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up, talking a little bit more about the performing arts, is to first of all talk about some of the lessons that you've learned along the way of your career journey. And as I'm listening to you describe this story, Jenny, going from the tech industry into what sounds like is an even more intense industry at times in consulting and Accenture, it's stressful to make a career switch. It is very stressful to have an intensive job. Sometimes I think what we can do is we can, or at least I find myself doing this, I kind of debate whether or not I should invest my time that is already quite limited into a side activity that's really different from my day job and maybe doesn't have a direct impact on my ability to excel at my day job. What have you learned from engaging in something like ballet that is something that is very unrelated to work? I'm just curious what you've learned from that. Of course, there's no direct relation, right? Because I'm doing IT and of course people would think that why don't you put your time into good use, like learning how to write in another programming language, you know, or earn another certificate, right? And I'm doing that too. But I felt like, you know, one day we're not going to be doing this job anymore, right? There will be a day that we get old. We want to retire, right? And we want to have something when we grow old. And it's important to develop a hobby something outside of your life because you're not just defined by your job. You may be spending 90% of your time at work, but that's not just who you are. That's just one part of you. And I have observed so many people, right, older than me. And I'm extremely lucky that I get to learn from them. I have some classmates who are more than 60 years old in my class. That's so amazing. I felt that, well, even though it's not directly related, it has been teaching me so many other life lessons, right? I mean, you don't have to always do things that can help you excel in your career in terms of technical skills. I'm actually a manager myself. When I talk to my younger colleagues, they wanted help. They wanted some reassurance. And I could always apply some of this philosophies that I learned from ballet and share these lessons or share these things with my colleagues, right? I felt that that helps you rethink how you want to live your life. And it's important to have a work-life balance, right? Like you can't just work all the time, right? Even developing hard skill sets, I would consider that, I mean, to me, it's like part of life. Of course, there are people who see that as a hobby, but I just wanted to do something different. And when you look back on your career change, Jenny, what's something that you wished you had known that you now know? I honestly wish that there was someone there to kind of share some tips and advice with me because, well, I did enjoy my short time at events planning, but I felt also that it's kind of like I, I took a detour. It's like maybe if there was someone that I could consult, maybe I would have reached here a little bit earlier and maybe I could avoid some pitfalls. I'm still grateful of the hard lessons that I learned, but I may not necessarily want others to repeat my mistakes. Final question for you before we wrap up. Having been through this career change, What's one thing that you've learned about yourself along the way? Growing up, I always thought that I was somewhat overconfident, somewhat arrogant. But, you know, when I decided to do the career switch, I realized that, well, actually, I do have the humility to accept that I just cannot do well in something. And I found a lot of peace in accepting that I'm just not good in some things and that's perfectly fine because I'm good in other things. I think that discovery has helped me to cope with a lot of things, right? Because some of my superior supervisors, 
managers, they are actually younger than me. And I don't feel bad at all taking instructions from them or like just learning from people younger than me. I realized that I've developed that humility that even people a lot younger than us always have things to teach us. And I think that's very important to me. That's good. I mean, I think that demonstrates how self-assured you are right now. Because I think a lot of times, one of the reasons why we don't accept advice from others or don't want to have advice from people, perhaps especially those people who are younger from us, is because we're not feeling super confident ourselves or we're a little insecure ourselves about something. So I think that demonstrates a real maturity on your part as you've gone through your journey here. What message would you want to share about performing arts in general? especially there in Singapore. I know you have listeners, a lot of listeners from Singapore as well, and maybe in the larger part of Asia, right? And I do hope that, you know, whoever is that listening to this would be more supportive towards performing arts. I mean, being of Asian descent, our Asian parents or even Asian parents in general are not that supportive of their children pursuing performing arts right and therefore you know artists they're not paid very well and they don't get a lot of funding what i hope and it's something that i hope i can do in the near future once i get used to all this hectic life you know sort of like stabilize because i think i'm still trying to stabilize things i do hope to put in more time to actually volunteer and help to grow the awareness in performing arts. I hope that more people would come to support the performances, be it buying a ticket, watching a performance, or even coming to volunteer, donating, you know. There's a lot of help that is needed for performing arts, and especially in a country like Singapore, where people value other white-collar jobs. And I hope people would start understanding that, you know, you can have a very successful life and career in performing arts. Is there any particular performing arts entity there in Singapore that you want to give a shout out to? Yes, definitely. I'm attending adult ballet classes at Singapore Ballet. I'm extremely grateful to my teachers there. And I hope that whoever's listening to this can buy a ticket, support their performances, you know. I know my teachers, they are always very encouraging and I know that they could use a bit more support. I want to thank Singapore Ballet for being part of this important journey of my growth and self-discovery. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jenny, for telling me more about your transitions from biology to IT to then project management, and also just the importance of your non-work activities and how those things have actually played such a big part in your own philosophies and perspectives. So it was very interesting hearing about how the performing arts have been a big part of your own journey. And I just wanted to wish you the best of luck with your role at Accenture and also your ongoing ballet classes and also hope you make a full recovery from COVID soon. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me, Joseph. Um, I do hope that by sharing my journey, I can you know, help a lot of people, like those who have doubts about changing careers or who are feeling unsure of where they are at the moment. I hope to be able to provide that little confidence and maybe just a little bit of positivity in their life. I think what you're doing is really meaningful, Definitely, I would continue to support your podcast and also wishing you all the best. Thank you so much, Jenny. I appreciate it. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Jenny's perspectives on the importance of acknowledging when you're not excelling at your chosen job, the upside of investing energy into a personal hobby, and accepting that you can't be good at everything. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'm going to talk about the various hobbies I've pursued outside of work in my own life and the impact they've had on my professional trajectory. Before we get to today's Mental Fuel, I wanted to thank Harmony Design for supporting this episode of Career Relaunch. The Harmony Standing Desk offers a smarter, healthier way to work with its simple design that fits into any workspace. It's the standing desk I use myself, and Career Relaunch listeners can get 15% off any Harmony order by visiting careerrelaunch.net slash harmony, spelled H-A-R-M-O-N-I, and using discount code RELAUNCH.
This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. So for today's Mental Fuel, I wanted to pick up on what Jenny said about giving yourself permission to do things outside of work that you just enjoy, even if they have absolutely nothing to do with your day job. And this got me thinking about my own life and the various hobbies or personal interests I've had over the years and how there have been times in my career when I didn't make space for hobbies outside of work and what impact those periods had on me. So I'll just start by saying that I wouldn't describe myself as someone who's had a lot of hobbies in my life, but I will just mention a few I've had over the years, some of which have trickled in somewhat surprising ways into my professional life and others that just lived in a completely separate space from my career. So going way back to my childhood, the very first hobby I can remember having at the age of five was recording things onto my mom's cassette tape recorder. I was really fascinated by the idea of captured audio And I would just record some of my favorite cartoon clips and TV ads onto these cassettes, which I actually still have to this day. This is actual audio I recorded in the early 80s from one of my favorite shows at the time called Thundercats. That should do it. And I used to love this theme song from an old cartoon called Popples. And this kind of went on for a couple years, actually. By the time I was seven, I went from recording stuff off the TV to recording my own voice in this little makeshift sound studio I made out of boxes and blankets in my closet at home. And I would close the door and just record myself. I would record myself reading kids poems. The title, Mr. Nobody, this is a poem. I know a funny little man as quiet as a mouse. He does a mischief that is done in everybody's house. I had this pretend news show where I would make up some news. And, 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 well, we're back at CBS Broadcasting News. The tiger and the bear are still on the loose. And we're not, there may be, they are maybe going to go to Canada. We're not sure. Or I would pretend to give the weather report. I am Joseph Lou. Uh, it is going to be Fahrenheit tomorrow and... Sunny the next week, not the next week, oh, excuse me, um, the day after tomorrow, on Thursday, it, it's going to be partly cloudy with the chance of showers. And I loved this. I would describe myself as a child who was really shy. I didn't like raising my hand in class. I was pretty quiet at school. I would get nervous doing things in front of large groups. And even now, I would describe myself as a very strong introvert. But at the time, speaking into that cassette recorder was sort of my way of freeing my voice into this little safe box in my hands. And I had no idea that many years later, I'd work at a radio station in Hawaii, actually reading the news and weather. Good afternoon. The time in the islands is four minutes past four o'clock. You're listening to All Things Considered on Hawaii Public Radio. I'm Joseph Liu with this local news update. Then about 15 years after that, I'd start this podcast. But looking back, the dots do actually kind of connect in ways I wouldn't have expected. Other things I loved doing growing up included playing tennis, playing video games, making mixtapes, and tinkering with computers. Then in my 20s, I got into salsa dancing and even taught salsa lessons at a Cuban nightclub in Washington, D.C. on the side when I was working at a consulting firm at the time. That actually marked the first time I held a microphone in my hands in front of an audience, which is something I do all the time now as a professional speaker. Then in my early 30s, when I was working at the Clorox company in the Bay Area doing brand marketing, I was really into cooking. 
So I would go to cooking classes or the farmer's market nearby to pick up random produce and try to concoct some new dishes in my kitchen. And this didn't have a huge impact on my actual day job, but it did remind me how much I loved food and planted the seeds to me eventually shifting into food brand marketing in the UK. Now, after moving to the UK about 12 years ago, I haven't really had that many hobbies. I do fit in exercise like running and swimming, but Beyond that, I haven't pursued anything new for a while. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. It could have been that work was just becoming more demanding or that I was focused on building my business or that I got married and wanted to spend any extra time I had with my wife or that we eventually had a kid and that took up more of my free time. And while all of these things are great and the lack of a hobby has actually allowed me to quite singularly focus on some other more pressing priorities during this chapter of my life and career, I have felt at times like my personal interests have taken too much of a backseat and that's resulted in my mind sometimes being a bit too occupied by work and these other things I mentioned. Now, the reason why I'm taking a trip down memory lane here with you is because in my life, when I look back, I do feel like every single hobby of mine has actually really benefited me in some way that hasn't always been obvious at the start, but manifested later. And I'm not even talking about them having some sort of eventual link to some part of my work. It helps me take a break to do something that's really refreshing, use my brain a different way, or just have some fun. As Jenny said, it just feels nice to feed your personal interests outside of work, regardless of whether anything concrete actually results from it. I think that sometimes I'm so focused on generating results or outcomes from the activities I engage in that I end up failing to focus on the actual act of just doing something that engages and energizes and excites me, which in and of itself is beneficial. So I just wanted to take this moment to encourage you to feed your interests and to make room for the things you enjoy doing outside of work. If you're like me with all the obligations you have in life, I sometimes feel a little guilty focusing inward and just doing something for me. But I think it's important to invest energies into the things you enjoy outside of work to balance out all the demands and intensity you may feel when you're at work. This takes me to a quote from the author Rochelle E. Goodrich. Try new hobbies, develop new interests, pursue new experiences. When you expand your interests, you increase your opportunities for happiness. So my challenge to you is to pursue a new hobby this year, perhaps an interest of yours that you've always thought about investing more energy into, but just haven't made the time for. And that's it. To not expect anything to necessarily come of it or for it to necessarily benefit you in any way or for you to even get very good at it, but instead to just allow yourself the freedom to do something you think would be cool. And this means regularly dedicating time for this hobby. Could you spare an hour on the weekends or even just 30 minutes one evening a week? Literally schedule this into your calendar just like you would any other important task. And I'm going to do this too. One of my New Year's resolutions is to finally learn more about photography. I have always loved pictures. I've always loved taking pictures. I've had this old Canon SLR camera for over a decade, and I never seem to be able to take decent pictures with it that aren't blurry, probably because I've never learned how to actually use it. So just this week, I sold that camera and bought myself a new state-of-the-art Fujifilm APS-C camera. I've started to read a book my wife got me about how to get the most out of your Fuji X-Series camera, and I'm finally going to take the time to learn about things like aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. And my hope is that pretty soon, I'll finally be able to take some decent pictures of our family that can make it into some wall frames. If you want to tell me what hobby you've decided to take up, if you have a question you want answered on the show, or if you have a story of career change in your own life you'd like to share, I'd love for you to leave me a voicemail with your thoughts at careerrelaunch.net slash 92, where you can also find a summary of my chat with Jenny and learn more about the Singapore Ballet. 
Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash nine two. Thanks again to Jenny Go for sharing her story with us today from Singapore. And thank you for being part of our listener community. This episode was mixed by Liam McKenzie. Today's music was curated by Jonathan Rinaldi-Pole. I'm Joseph Liu, and I'll talk to you next time.